Good morning and welcome to God's Tribe. I'm glad that you're here this morning to celebrate 11 years of God's goodness and kindness to us as a church. Uh, we're going to start this morning, I uh, just asked a couple people here to share a testimony, and so I think Hannah's going to go first for us, uh, and then Eric will share as well, so uh, j- they're just going to share a testimony about the church. Thank you, guys. Hi. Oh. <laughs> Good morning, church. I don't know if I should stand here. Um, it's a humbling experience to be before you today. Um, We were asked to do a testimony of our stay at God's tribe, and mine starts like this. Um, I was born and raised in South Africa, for some people who don't know, and when I reached the age of 18 and I had finished um, high school, my dad decided we should just move back. And for me, that was a very hard change because I grew up in South Africa, or my family was in South Africa, and I had a church in South Africa. So my dad had come first before me, and he told me that there's a church called God's Tribe, and I was like, well, (laughs) that doesn't um, impress me in any way. Until I get there, I'll, I'll see. He said, don't worry, it will be your home. This is the place that God has chosen for you. And I mean, I was a bit curious, and so when I came the first day, I was mind blown. Um, I was mind blown at the fact that it was the church that I was looking for. Um, I highly, 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 I highly value the Word of God being taught in truth. And it was something that I was like, where would I start when I get to Tanzania? I don't know the language. I only know my family. And where would, where would I find that church? And through my, my brother's family and through my dad as well, when I came here, it was just an instant I'm at home. Like an instant, Hannah, this is where you will be based. And so um, my testimony is more leaned on community. And so I just want to share the fact that when I got to God's tribe, the one thing that has always uplifted me was the community that I found here. The older sisters and brothers who have gone ahead in the faith and were able to uplift me in my hardest times. I remember there were times where I had conversations with Trudy, with Arthur, with Alice, and these people not knowingly always spoke the word that I needed at that particular moment. And so I, I want to encourage someone that don't be like me. I came in thinking I'll be on my own. I don't need people. Um, I don't need community. But God opened my heart to more people, to more people in the faith who were able to convict me when I was wrong, encourage me when I was right. And I think we forget how much that helps us even when we are facing battles on our own. There are times where I'd remember, okay, Trudy said I should do this. Or Arthur said I should look at things this way. So my testimony is just that I praise God that I found a home that was not only just lovey-dovey, but it was hardcore conviction that I knew that God had more plans for me. Even when I thought that Tanzania would be such a weird country to adapt to, but God made a way. And I just want to praise God that I found a church such as this that I was able to be <laughs> lifted from depression that I had, lifted from being lonely, lifted from choosing not to serve and serving. So I just want to praise God again for that opportunity and that knowledge of him. Um, Again, I just want to say that I appreciate so, so much the amount of fellowship. Um, A lot of people, I don't know how to explain this, but 
again, I'm a person who sounds social. <laughs> I can speak in front of people, but in a crowd, I can stand on my own. I can dissociate myself with people. And having people, again, older sisters who would hold my hand deliberately, like Hannah, do this. Hannah, serve this way. Hannah, do more. I, you guys have no idea how that has changed the way I look at God because, again, there was a time where I thought I could do things on my own, and that's not the gospel. Doing things on your own is not the gospel. You need to lean on God. You need to deny yourself. You need to totally submit, totally let go. And so, again, I appreciate so, so much the community that is here. I praise God yet again for all the people that God assigned to me and yeah, praise God. Thank you. Well, good morning, church. Um, so I'll be quick. My testimony is just uh, centered around the current church initiatives uh, being evangelism and uh, love dar. So uh, two weeks ago, sort of, um, Brother Tony gave me a call in the morning and he was like, Eric, um, God's tribe is having um, an initiative, Love Dar, and um, the heart to reach out to people and just show them the love of God. And um, how better to do that um, than to evangelize with them and to share the gospel with them. So as we all know from the Love Dar um, schedule, it is beginning on the 22nd of September. So he suggested that why don't you come and walk around me every day from the 1st of September to the 21st um, around Dar. So yeah, being the 1st of September, we went to Mlimani City, um, the mall where we all go to buy um, stuff for our kids, for ourselves. And we went there, just prayed to God, and we're like, God, just uh, people whom you have chosen to hear the gospel today, just lead us to them. And we started from the, I don't know if you know, the side where the Turkish restaurant is. So we aimed to start from there all the way to uh, Mr. Price uh, KFC, where it is right now. Um, just long story short, we spoke to a couple of people, um, most of them being Muslim. And I think um, what Joe, Joe had me share is um, a highlight was actually on Tuesday. So on Tuesday before men's discipleship, that is Mbezi Kwazen at the church office, again with Brother Tony, we were like, let us go again today and share the gospel. And um, when we began um, at the shops just before Kivolini Plaza, the Vodacom shop at Mbezi Beach, we started the first shop. We met two Christian uh, Muslim um, ladies, Aisha and Aisha. Um, the old Aisha was with the young Aisha. And then we began. Tony was very ill that Tuesday, but uh, we asked the grace of God to help us to share. So as he began to share, um, the young teenage Aisha listened very attentively. And then we had the her sister also paying attention. But when it got the time to now um, initiate them to receive Christ, um, the old Aisha really resented the message. She, she was like, I am not going to receive this Christ. But I was watching every time Tony was sharing, the other Aisha was actually paying so much attention. And even when Tony mentioned, you have to receive Christ, she was like, yes, 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 I need to receive her now. And when it got to the moment that we want to um, lead now in prayer, the young Aisha to receive Christ, she really wanted to receive. But the older Aisha was like, you know the implication, you live with your sister who is very religious, she's going to chase you out of your place. But she was like, I don't care, I'm receiving Christ today. She received Christ that very moment. Now moving forward, we went to the next shop, Hannah. Um, her name is Hannah, sorry. Uh, she also was a professing Christian, nominal Christian. But again, when you speak and share the gospel, you just see this eagerness and hunger that people have to, to, to receive the gospel. She also accepted Christ. Now, what stood out to me is the next guy that we um, went to the shop of, um, even if you pass today, it's a Puma gas um, shops. They sell this gas um, cylinders. Her name, his name is Abdur Razak. And what stood out to me is that immediately when we entered the shop, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a shop, it's a public shop, but this guy has his, um, they call him Saf in, 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 in Islam, 
and uh, a book called Principles of Life by Muhammad. And just adjacent to where he was sitting, there was a prayer mat. So this guy clearly loved the Lord and oh, loved God. And uh, I was like, God, it's my time to share. And I was like, God, how do I start sharing with this guy? Clearly, he knows his stuff. And um, as we know, the story of Paul when he entered Athens, and he was like, guys, you seemed to be so knowledgeable about God, seeking, seeming to find God. But even that's, that's the same line that I started with. Brother, you seem so knowledgeable about, about God. Is that true? And he was like, yeah, you can see my books here and everything. So that's the gear that the Holy Spirit kind of prompted me to start with. So as I was sharing with him, you could tell that he really wanted to please God. But that's not the way that God had um, presented that man should follow him. He was really trying out of his own efforts to seek God. And we have so many people like that in Dar es Salaam who are desperately trying to seek God and have God in their lives, but not in the right way. Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. So it is our duty as a church. We even afterwards was with Tony. We're like all three places we went, they received Christ eagerly. Not even that, oh, yes, let me receive Christ so that you can go away. But they really were um, hungry for the gospel. So it is our duty. I see seats are empty right now. How much if each one of us um, just called one brother or sister, be like once a week, we used, I don't know, it wasn't even 30 minutes to go to those people, and all three of them received Christ. So please, I urge you again to um, love Dar the way God loved Dar and evangelize and fill up these seats. Let's have two services, and um, God will be glorified. Asante Nisana. I'll be reading from Luke chapter 5, verse 1 to 11. It says, On one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, and he saw two boats by the lake. But the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, master, we toiled all night and took nothing, but at your word, I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boats to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' feet saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon and Jesus said to Simon, do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. Amen. All right. Thank you, Hannah, for reading for us this morning. Again, happy anniversary, God's tribe. I'm really glad that you're all here this morning. As a community of believers, we've been, we're a relatively young church, 11 years, um, but I think in the 11 years that we've had, we've seen maybe our fair share of uh, difficulty and loss. As Trudy mentioned this morning, obviously the greatest of these is the loss of Pastor Sheshi. Uh, who was an amazing pastor, an amazing father, an amazing husband, 
and an exemplary person that we could all look to as a follower of Christ. Uh, his loss was difficult, and it still is difficult. Uh, me and Arthur were even reminiscing just a couple weeks ago about the, the loss of Sheshi and how deeply we still feel that loss. Uh, he was deeply loved, but he shepherded this church so well. He, he loved this church deeply. Uh, he, he gave everything he had to this church. And if you know the, the testimony of Sheshi, you know that what he gave up even to come here and start the church. Uh, and so we're thankful for what the, the, the groundwork that he laid, the foundation that he was laid and he has missed. And we all miss him deeply. Uh, but one of the things that his loss has shown me, and I, I know Arthur as well, because we, again, we, we talked about this, was is, is God's faithfulness and love for this church. It would have been so easy with the loss of our founding pastor, the one who really, I mean, we were, we were, we were young. We were even younger then than we are now. It would have been so easy for things to, to crumble and for this church to, to die. And so the fact that we still are here this morning as God's tribe church is a testimony to God's goodness, his faithfulness, and his love for this church. We're all here this morning as a community of God's tribe church because of God's love and faithfulness. However, I think we're at a pivotal moment. I'm getting some feedback up here. I don't know if you guys are, if you can maybe tweak some stuff. Um, However, I think we're at a pivotal moment in the life of this church. Uh, and I want to just look at this passage this morning. We're taking a quick break from First Peter that we've been going through. Uh, and we're looking, going to look at this passage in Luke chapter 5 that Hannah just read for us. Because I, I feel like as a church, we've kind of cast out our nets. We've, we've caught some fish. We, we've seen what God can do, but I want us to ask ourselves this morning, are we content with a full boat of fish? Are we content with just the fish that we have? Or do we want, like what we just saw from Peter, do we want more? And so let's pray this morning and ask God to bless our time together, thank Him these wonderful 11 years that he has given us as a church, and uh, we'll look at this passage in Luke chapter 5 this morning. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your goodness, your faithfulness, your love that you have made so clearly evident to this church. Lord, we thank you for the work that you have done in the past. Lord, we thank you for how you've watched over and protected this church. But Lord, we pray that as we look at 11 years of your faithfulness, that we would not stop here, but that we would push ahead. That we would look at what you have in store for us as God's tribe for the next 11 years and beyond. Lord, we thank you again for all that you've done. We praise you for all that you will do. It's in Jesus' name that we pray and ask these things. Amen. So just to kind of quickly recap what's going on in this story, right? Jesus is teaching. It talks about how he's teaching. He's preaching the word. And people are, like usual, they are gathering around Jesus. There's crowds and crowds of people that are coming to hear him coming to hear what he has to say. And 
So much so that he, I, I can only imagine they've gathered around every side of him. They're pushing in on him. The crowd is growing and growing. And Jesus is like, there's a lake right here. There's a boat right there. I'm going to get in that boat. I can go out a little ways. And it served multiple purposes. More people would have actually been able to hear him because he's, they're able to line up on the shore. Sound travels good over water, right? So he's like, hey, I'm gonna, can I get in this boat? Can I, can I go out a little ways? So he gets a little bit of space between him and the people, and then more people can hear him. But he sees these fishermen, right, that are all sitting there. They're all uh, cleaning these nets. We find out later on that they're, they're cleaning nets after having not caught anything, which if there's one thing that I can imagine would be incredibly annoying, it's having to work after not having any fruit from your work. And so they're probably angry and frustrated and not in a very good mood. And we see that Jesus says, hey, can I push me out a little ways from shore? So he sits down in the boat and he's teaching. And as he teaches right? He, he's teaching all these people around, and then he, he finishes. We don't see much about what happens from the teaching, but we see that afterwards he turns to Peter and he says, hey, you know, kind of a thank you for letting him use his boat. He says, you know, hey, let's go out a little bit deeper and put down your nets again. And we see that, that Peter, you can almost, I feel like you can almost sense his annoyance in his response. He's like, Hey, we, we've been out all night and we haven't caught anything. But if, basically, if you're telling me to do it, I'll do it. He's, he doesn't seem overly confident that anything is going to happen. But he says, Lord, if, if you're telling me to do it, then I'll do it. And so they push off in a little bit deeper water. And you can, I just feel like you can feel the cynicism. Like, like he doesn't think, like, this is, I'm going to have to clean these nets again. I've just gotten done with all this work. They throw the nets out, and all of a sudden, right, it's just completely filled to the breaking point with fish. And we see that in that moment that they, they let down their nets, and these, they're, they're completely filled, they've caught all of these fish, that Peter's reaction is not like this super joyful reaction. Instead, they get all these fish into the two boats, right, because they had to call for help, and it's so filled that both boats are, like, weighed down and about to sink. And his, his, his response isn't to rejoice in the fact that they probably just made more money than they had made in the last month, but instead his response is that he falls on his knees, and he says, I'm a, I'm a sinful man. He realizes his sin in the presence of Jesus. And we see that Jesus looks at Peter, and there's James and John there as well, three disciples, perhaps the three most well-known disciples. And he looks at them and he says, hey, from now on, you are going to catch men. You're going to catch people. And we see that they go to shore. And it says that they leave everything. That immediately as they go to shore, it says, and when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. This is an amazing story of how God calls really his first disciples here. But I want us to, to look at this passage this morning, and again, it might seem like a strange passage for an anniversary service, but I think that we find ourselves in a similar place today, where God has done some work in the church. He's made some things happen. There's been some excitement, and we have the opportunity to respond in one of two ways. So I want to look at three quick points this morning, three quick points, and we're going to close in some more songs this morning, which I think is appropriate given the celebration of 11 years. But before we do that, let's look at these three points that God has for us today. The first one is that although we may not understand it, 
we must trust and obey the call of Christ in our lives. Although we may not understand it, we have to trust and obey the call of Christ in our lives. Jesus' request to Peter did not make sense to Peter, probably. He's standing there, and again, I feel like you, you can sense the frustration as Jesus is like, hey, go out a little deeper and throw the nets down. He's like, you're, one, you're not a fisherman, right? You're a carpenter. You, you got, you know, you're not a fisherman. You don't know what you're doing. I've been out all night. I've been working. I know where the fish are on this lake, and there's, we've, we've caught nothing. We have nothing to show for our work. Jesus' request didn't make sense to Peter, and it was probably frustrating for him. God often calls us to do difficult and hard things, things that do not make sense to us, things that if we just objectively stop and look at them, we're like, what? that doesn't make sense. Why would I do that? Why would you call me to do that? Why would you have me do this thing? That doesn't seem like the best way to go about it. It doesn't seem like a good choice. So many things that God calls us to do, when we look at them, we think how it will only complicate our lives. You're only, it feels, maybe sometimes it feels like you're only trying to make my life more difficult. Why why would I go about it that way? Why would you have me do this? Again, this request to Peter probably seemed foolish to him. Again, Jesus was not a fisherman. He's standing there. He's like, push out a little deeper and throw down your nets. And I don't know, but I feel like in the response that we see from Peter, that it is kind of a task that is carried out half-heartedly. Like, all right, I'll do it if you tell me to. I don't think he was like rowing extra far to go to the spots that he thought were maybe good. I feel like he went just out deep enough and he's like, and about to say, are, are you happy now? Like, often what God calls us to do in the moment, it does not make sense. God's work we see in this that God's work displays his power and it reveals our weakness and our insufficiency. Again, God's work displays his power and it reveals our, our work, our weakness, excuse me, and insufficiency. And like Arthur talked about, I think we can add on to that, that it brings righteous fear. <laughs> it brings a righteous fear because Peter here Again, his response is not to be all joyful at the fish that he just caught, but instead he realizes his unworthiness as he stands before Jesus. But God's work displays his power and reveals our weakness and insufficiency. And I think, obviously, that God does this on purpose. God calls us often to do things in ways that we wouldn't think to do them because when he accomplishes what he wants to accomplish, it is him who will receive the glory. It is he who will receive the glory. He says, that seems dumb to you, do it. And watch me accomplish what I want to accomplish. I will receive the praise and the glory. And again, It serves to show others that it is God, and it serves to show us that it is God. We cannot take credit for anything good that that we do. It is only God working in and through us. As Eric stood up here this morning and shared about him and Tony going out on Tuesday night, ask them, was it anything special that they said? Was it because they're such gifted communicators? Was it because they have this amazing ability that nobody else has? No. Not, not trying to be mean, Tony or Eric. You guys are wonderful. <laughs> you guys are great. 
But they knew pretty quickly within walking up to those people, they could already see God working in their hearts. It is God that softens hearts. It is God that opens eyes. The Bible uses the the picture repeatedly that we are brought from death to life. Me and you cannot bring people from death to life. Only God can bring people from death to life. It relieves the tension and the burden that we often place on ourselves because only God can bring people to life that are dead. We are simply called to go and share and be his communicators. We are not capable. We are not sufficient. We are not able to do the task that we've been called to do in and of ourselves. But with Christ in us, with the Holy Spirit guiding us, we are able to be a part of God's work. Peter sees Jesus' power. I bet it's the first time that he ever saw fish swimming into a net instead of out of it. (laughs) I thought about that. Like, I've tried to catch things. Like, my grandma lives on a lake, and I used to try to, when you're little, you know, stick the net in real quick and catch fish. I, I didn't usually have them swim into the net. But can you imagine as Peter throws this net out, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, come all of these fish swimming into a net? He sees God's power, and he knows that it's not any special special fisherman abilities that he has, but it is God. Look back, even at your own life, maybe your own time that you've spent in this church. Look back at the, the history of the church from the different places that we met before I was even here to the, the gym over there, to now here. God has moved. He's worked. He is blessed. He has loved this church. And in turn, he's loved and blessed each and every one of us that is here today. Look in your own life. Think back over this story of your life. You may be going through difficulties and struggles. But again, we have seen repeatedly this year as we've looked through different topics, but especially as we've been in 1 Peter, even just the few weeks we have been, that even in the midst of our struggles, the hope that we have because of what Christ has done for us, how we're able to face those struggles and those difficulties because of what God has done for us. often in moments when we feel most blessed, when we see God's love, His care, His goodness, His grace, His mercy in our lives, the proper response is a feeling of unworthiness. A feeling of unworthiness that leads to gratitude. At those moments in our lives where we see so clearly God moving and working in our life. It often brings what we see with Peter, that feeling of unworthiness. But that should produce in us gratitude for what Christ has done. We don't sit there and think, oh, how unworthy I am. We feel it, but we say, man, I am unworthy. I can't do it on my own. But then we look and we say, but it is through Christ. Man, how thankful I can be because of what Christ has done. At Men's Discipleship this week, we we were talking, and one of the big things that we talked about is it is good to feel like you can't do it. Feeling like you can't accomplish something on your own is a great place to be. (laughs) That's what we decided. Because it is in those moments that we say, I cannot do it on my own. God, please help me. I can't do this on my own. 
So when you feel unworthy, you realize it is because you are unworthy. But Christ has made you worthy. He has made you worthy to accomplish the task that he has called you to. There's an unworthiness that produces gratitude because of what Christ has done. Second, I need to speed up a bit here. When Jesus calls you to engage in his work, don't settle for fish. (laughs) Don't settle for fish. Peter could have been amazed by that amazing catch, right? Two boats sinking as they come in. Could have been all pumped and excited about that. And I think he was. Obviously, the response that we see, I think he was excited. I think he was amazed at what he had seen. But he realized, instead of being so consumed with the fish, instead that only made Peter more hungry, more desirous to see what other work Jesus wanted to accomplish. What else can this guy do? If he can cause fish to swim into this net, what else can he do? And he wasn't content to just have two boats filled with fish, a lot of money in his pocket. This story is not about how obeying God leads to prosperity. (laughs) Because I think I've heard quite a few sermons on this where, you know, do what God says and and you'll get your boats filled. But instead it's about God's call being greater than earthly prosperity. It's about God's work being greater. It's about how when we we see Jesus accurately, when we see him for who he is, a boatload of money won't keep us from obeying and following him. Won't keep us from doing what he calls us to do. Because we see that the response from Peter, James, and John isn't that they stay there with their boat full of fish and think, they don't try to, try to, start to strike up some kind of deal with Jesus. Like, hey, you come once a week, you, you, you do this, we'll, we'll split it, you know, 50-50. They don't try to do that with him. But instead, they're like, they get back to shore and they're, they're like, we're, we're going with you. They don't even think about what's in the boats anymore. It doesn't matter about the fish. But what else can this Jesus do? Again, the beauty of the Christian life is that God allows us to be a part of what he is doing. He allows us to partake in his work. What an amazing thing. Again, we've seen in 1 Peter how the Christian life provides purpose and hope. It is in the Christian life that we can find purpose and hope for this life. And another thing that we see is that in this life, we never arrive. We're never going to arrive in this life and get to the point where we're like, well, I've done it. (laughs) I'm done. But in the Christian life, when we arrive in heaven, that's, that's when we've arrived. But until then, we push forward. We work with diligence to accomplish what God has called us to accomplish. And what an amazing gift and responsibility it is for each and every person that calls him father. I think, sadly, we are often far too easily content. We're often easily content. Again, they could have looked at those fish and been like, man, we're good. Today, it's good and it's right that we should rejoice in the victories and the challenges that we've overcome. We can rejoice in looking back at seeing what God has done. We should rejoice today. We should should look back and be thankful to God for, for what he has done. And we should rejoice in what he has done today. But man, how much more 
should we look at those things and be like Peter that day and say, God, you've done amazing things, but I can't wait to see what else you're going to do. Peter was impressed. I think about Peter was impressed by fish that day. Fish in a net. And he should have been, right? It was impressive. It was a, an amazing thing that Jesus did. But he would go on to see the sick made well, the blind to see, the lame walk in the dead brought to life. Those fish that day were so small compared to what Jesus had in store for Peter. He was not satisfied with fish, but he trusted that Jesus had even greater things to accomplish. In closing, uh, band, you guys can start to come back up if you'd like. God's tribe. I am convinced that this is true for us. I'm convinced of it. As I, I thought and prayed this week, and as I excuse me. As I looked back at what God has accomplished already in this church, how He's again watched over us and protected us. We can all, anybody that's been here for any amount of time, can see God's protection for this church and His love for this church. God has richly blessed us. But I am convinced that now is not the time to sit back and say, well, look, look what God's done. Look at these boats that God has filled. But in faith and with joy and amazement at what God has already done, we should push ahead. Push ahead to even greater things that God has in store for us. And I truly, truly believe that that God has even greater things in store for this church and for each and every one of you. I truly believe that God's greatest work and our best days are still ahead. If we follow Him, sorry, If we do what, what Peter did and what James and John did that day, if we look back, if we say, thank you, Lord, for what you've done, and then we, with gratitude, with thankfulness, with joy and amazement, say, all right, what else do you have? <laughs> and rely on him and trust in him. And like the guy, like, like Eric shared this morning, if we go about and we engage with people in our daily lives, there are so many people that are hungry and thirsty to hear the gospel. So many people that we encounter that are broken, that are tired, that are weary, that are empty and are searching for the purpose and the hope and the joy that you have. I know I say it all the time, but the quote from Spurgeon, I can't believe that you've tasted the sweet honey of the gospel if you think you can eat it all yourself. <laughs> if you think you can, you can just consume it all yourself and you don't need to share it with others, then you're missing the point. I hope that this church is known for the way that we love others, the way that we care for others, that we reach out to those around us that need the hope, that need the purpose, that need the joy, that need the life that we have been given through Jesus Christ. God's tribe, again, 
greater things, I really believe that greater things are still ahead for us. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we stand here this morning as testimonies, living testimonies of your goodness and your love and your grace and your mercy in our lives. We acknowledge that it is only because of you that we are here today. Lord, we pray that you would help us as a church to, yes, look at what you've done with gratitude and thankfulness. But Lord, may we push ahead for the greater things that you have in store. May we not become satisfied with what you've given us. Not that you haven't been good, but that we trust that you are wanting to do even greater things. Lord, I thank you for each person that calls this church home. I thank you for the way that they love, the way that they serve. But Lord, will you continue to grow us, continue to make us more like you, continue to help us as we live our lives to follow you more closely, to love you more deeply. We praise you. We thank you for all that you've done. Again, we cannot wait to see what you will still do. In Jesus' name, amen. businesses and people who are in mission work. I felt the Holy Spirit say that you need to remove the glasses that you've been wearing, the lens. You've been wearing dark glasses and you can't see the people very well. In your, it almost seems like a person who runs their own business, you're, you've shifted focus from what God wants you to be doing and you're focusing on other things and not on people. And today God is saying it's a day of new beginnings that you should shift your focus to see people because Christ came for people. He did not come for your systems or laws or bylaws or the things that you're selling. If you're, if you're running a business and you're selling a product, I felt the Holy Spirit say that he didn't come for the product. Jesus came for people. So people are coming in and out of your life. It almost feels like people are coming in and out of your life and you're not recognizing and seeing people because of the glasses you're wearing. And the Lord says, just shift. Remove the lens that you're wearing and start to see my people. It's almost like every day now when you wake up, you will have a new sight. And if for those who are in mission work, I almost feel like the Lord is saying, needs to come, you need to come to a place of repentance for the things that you're doing, that you really think you're on mission for God, but you've become misaligned and the Lord just wants us to realign again, that Christ came for people and that we must not be satisfied, that we just live in satisfaction because things seem to be going well for us but actually we don't see the people that Christ came for. So as we go into a time of worship, let that just sink in our spirits. And if you don't run a business or you don't, you're not on the mission, you don't run a mission organization, maybe it's just in your normal daily life that God is calling you to shift and see the new beginnings that he's calling you to. Amen.